We are moving on to a new unit, dramatic structure. Our key concepts for this unit are dramatic values, kinds of plot structure, the difference between story and plot, and the parts, or sometimes called elements, of the plot. We call this Aristotelian dramatic values because it is Aristotle who in his book, The Poetics, wrote a lengthy essay about what he believed made plays, made theater, effective, or to use another term, good. Um, I think it's kind of fascinating that really the six bulleted items that I have here are still in every play. In fact, most films and television shows as well. Um, they are present in everything, but to varying degrees. That's why we term it value. It means more or less of something. Um, in the Poetics, Aristotle writes that plot means that the value in that play relies very heavily on the action on stage, what we see happening on stage. Now, don't get confused. This does not mean uh, what we get as exposition when characters come on and tell us what has happened before the play starts. He means literally what the characters are doing. Uh, the second Aristotelian dramatic value lies in the emphasis or our knowledge of the characters in the play. How much do we know about the characters? How much do they talk about themselves? What is conveyed about the characters? You know, the first two values, I think, we really understand in a modern context because we so often hear the term a character-driven drama or an action movie. It's basically the same idea. Thought means the theme or the intellectual message of the play. What is the playwright trying to say through the characters and their actions? Diction means the vernacular of the, the, vernacular of the characters. How do they speak? Do they use uh, complicated words? Um, do they speak in a poetic language? Uh, does diction, the way they speak, do different characters uh, speak in a way that indicates they're of a different social class? Uh, these are, this is what we mean by diction, the words. Music, at the time that Aristotle was writing about uh, the dramatic values, he felt music was contained in the chorus because they did still chant. They still had a rhythmic quality uh, to their language. Um, the melody of a play today means, because we do musical theater, uh, means that there is literally music uh, sometimes you would look at a play uh, written by Shakespeare and say that there is a definite rhythm to his iambic pentameter, the language of his play. Now, the final dramatic value is spectacle. And I think this can be the one that's a little harder for us to understand because it doesn't mean that it's spectacular and that it's bright and flashy or... Um, anything like that, it simply means the visual universe of the play. You know what? All of those space art elements, the sets, costumes, lights, how important is that environment to the play? Every modern play has an environment to it, but sometimes those environments are almost as important as another character. If you take a play like um, The Diary of Anne Frank, for example, the importance of that set looking small and claustrophobic to give the visual illusion that they are living in an attic is very important. Um, so spectacle would be a very high-ranking dramatic value. And ranking of dramatic values is what your class assignment number three is really all about. Um, let's do this as an example. I'm going to use 
1939 film, The Wizard of Oz. I find that the majority of my students have seen that film at some point. Now, Aristotle felt that this ranking, plot, character, thought, in this order, was perfect. Because he was looking at the play Oedipus, which he thought was the best play that he had seen staged during his lifetime. And this is the order that that play emphasizes, and that is what he felt every play should you know, strive to be. But of course, that is not the creative spirit. Uh, many writers emphasize one thing over another. For example, if we look at the 1939 version of Wizard of Oz, I would say that spectacle would be number one. What is it when we think back on that film? What's the first, one of the first at least, things that we think of? We think of all the bright colors and munchkin land and, and the spectacle of the play. I would say that next would be music. We all think about the music. Somewhere Under the Rainbow, Follow the Yellow Brick Road. Um, next, I would rank character. Because we live through the characters as they travel down, and that would be the fourth plot, the action of going down that yellow brick road. It wouldn't mean anything, though, if we didn't have those characters all seeking something specific that they miss in themselves. Fifth, I would put thought, because there's definitely a theme to it, and that is uh, we have in us all along what we really want. Last, I would put diction. I would think diction is still present in that film because you have Dorothy who lives in Kansas, you have uh, the, uh, the Oz who is from her country, her, her uh, Kansas, and has landed in Oz just like you, whereas all the characters who are in Oz, most of them have kind of a little bit of a British dialect, and it separates them. Um, so that's how we use Aristotelian dramatic values today. When I'm directing a show, do I sit down and write out my six dramatic values? No, but I'm aware of it innately. I've directed the play, The Wizard of Oz, and on an AC budget, I certainly was not going to have flying monkeys and the amount of spectacle that the film has. But you know what I did have? I did have some really good actors who could sing. So if I were to rank the Aristotelian dramatic values based on my Wizard of Oz, I would put character first instead of spectacle, then music, then plot spectacle, and then diction and thought would be the final two. It is much different every time you do a play. Uh, when you do your class assignment number three, you will see the instructions that tell you to choose a film. I want you to choose something uh, live action, no, an uh, no animation, because that is always spectacle first. And then I want you to rank these six, six things based on their prevalence in that film. In theater, we use several different kinds of plot structures. Uh, the first plot structure that I have here, a linear plot, sometimes this is called a story play, this is the plot that we're most familiar with with a very common classic narrative, meaning that there's exposition where we're introduced to the characters, and then as we follow the characters through the rest of the plot, there's a cause and effect. Something happens in each scene, which it causes the next scene to happen, etc., etc. If you look at classic fairy tales, uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, that's a linear story type plot. Um, linear plots are chronological. They do not use subplots. A very straightforward kind of plotting. It utilizes the most uh, traditional plot elements, which we're going to go over at the end of this PowerPoint. 
However, the plot structure that we probably are the most familiar with in film and television, and now it's becoming a um, much more usable plot in theater, is episodic plot. Episodic plot, you have one narrative plot that is the most important characters and they're what they're doing, but there are subplots, and in these subplots there are other characters and events that weave in to that main plot. So you have a series of events which seem unrelated, but later they weave together and make sense. If you look at something like, well, all the Star Wars movies, um, Lord of the Rings, there's a point in which Sam and Frodo have a plot, uh, the, the characters of, um, you know, the elf, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Legolas and uh, the dwarf and um, Aragon, they all have a plot. In other words, they each have what's going on that all weaves together at the end for the big happy ending. That's an episodic plot. The three plot structures that I have here, thematic, circular, and ritualistic, are plot structures that you find in theater but very rarely in film. Uh, thematic plot, that's a plot that has many scenes. Uh, the, the scenes are almost like uh, many plays. They have different characters and their situations and they do not interact with the scene that comes before or after. Not always in chronological, they're not always using the same characters and situations. What ties these plots together is a common theme, a common idea. Um, a good example of that is the play Shadowbox. In the Shadowbox, it takes place in a hospice where there are different families, each with a family member who is ill and in hospice, and you see the scenes with the family members as they deal with their grief, and, and in many different ways. Uh, y these families do not meet one another. They don't have one main thread, one main plot that ties all of the scenes together, as does episodic plotting. However, at the end of the play, you recognize why you're seeing all these little mini plays together. It's because they have the same theme, the same idea that holds them all together. Circular plotting is a plotting device that's used a lot in um, absurdist theater, very um, progressive kind of theater. It focuses on an idea. Uh, sometimes it's very image driven. It can be episodic in nature. It has a very non traditional climax. You know, plots are designed to keep the audience's anticipation rising and rising in interest, and then you get to the end where you have some kind of fulfill fulfilling feeling uh, with that climax of your plot. With absurdist plotting, it's not always that kind of traditional kind of climax. Um, circular plotting is about bringing about an intellectual, uh, emotional reaction that's much less dependent on traditional characters and situations. Uh, probably the best known um, most produced play that is circular plotting is a play called Waiting for Godot. In Waiting for Godot, there are two characters who enter. They begin a discussion. Hi, hello. Uh, I'm here waiting. Yeah, I'm waiting too. Who are you waiting for? I'm waiting for Godot. Oh, you're waiting for Godot. Why are you waiting for Godot? And you have a whole act where they really are just um, taking part in small talk. Another couple of characters come on. They talk about and do some silly things on stage. Nothing really happens. It's intermission. The lights come up again. The two characters walk on. Well, hi. I'm here waiting for Godot. Why are you here? Well, I'm waiting for Godot, too. Do you know who Godot is? Well, I don't know who Godot is. And they continue with this kind of dialogue that's humorous 
Uh, in the 80s, it was Robin Williams and Billy Crystal who did a rather famous uh, production of Waiting for Godot. But again, the, this play goes really nowhere. If you ask, what is this play about? It's really just two guys waiting for Godot. But the playwright, the artists, want the audience to focus when they leave on their kind of confusion. And wow, you know what? That's kind of like life. What happens? We get up every morning. We go to work. We do the same things day after day after day. It is, again, about bringing about that visceral um, kind of intellectual, emotional reaction to something. You know, this is a play that was written shortly after World War II and the atomic bomb. And the playwright was very interested in trying to convey what does life mean if you can wipe it out within seconds. Um, so circular plotting, again, is something we use in theater often, but we do not see that in film. Uh, ritualistic plotting is plotting that's trying to get back to the emotions and the ritual of theater as we think it begins. You know those Greek dithyrambic odes where the community is involved. There's lots of movement. It's lots of sometimes symbolic imagery and this is where we're starting to see a lot of slides and CGI effects. It's about the look and the feel, the ritual of theater. Before we talk about the parts of the plot, um, I do want to differentiate between story and plot. We use the two terms often interchangeably. Technically, though, when you are talking about parts of the plot, there's a difference. Um, story is everything we know about the characters and situation. It is what the plot is drawn from. Now, how do we get story? Well, we get it from what the characters say about what has happened before the play starts. We get it from other characters who come on and talk about what's happening in the world of the play that we do not see on stage. Um, if, we're, if we're looking at doing a play, say, about the life of Abraham Lincoln, maybe our play is not biographical about his entire life, but we know that he's born and then he lives until he's assassinated. But maybe our play is only the day before he's assassinated until his death. So the story is everything about Abraham Lincoln's life. So what is the plot? Well, the plot is only what we see on stage. So it is only what we're staging the day before he is assassinated until his death. Think of it as a section of the overall story. And again, plot is only what we see on stage. What do we call the moment in the story? You know, the story of Abraham Lincoln. And we call out, we have now our plot. The point of attack is the moment where the plot starts. We don't actually see, it just is. In other words, the curtain opens the night before a, um, a Abraham Lincoln's assassination, that is the moment of the point of attack. So if we were to have a linear line, we could see the birth of Abraham Lincoln, the death of Abraham Lincoln, and real close to the death of Abraham Lincoln would be our point of attack, which would be the night that is before his assassination. Moving on to parts or elements of the plot. The parts of the plot are um, one of my favorite things to talk about because once you know the parts of the plot, it's really hard to ever watch any kind of play the same again. All right, so let's start with exposition. Exposition in a play is similar to exposition in any novel or short story. 
Um, it establishes the situation, the background information, introduces you to the characters on stage. It is basically uh, getting you ready with all the information that you need to understand what's the rest of the play. Um, sometimes you will hear about progressive exposition. In the world of the play, there are characters which are coming on stage having been a part of the world of the play and they give information to the characters on stage that the characters then act upon. Uh, that's progressive exposition. If we look at our example of The Wizard of Oz, you can say that everything at the beginning of the, pl of the film that is in black and white, where we learn about Dorothy, Aunt Em, Uncle Henry, uh, we know she has a neighbor who hates her dog Toto, all of that stuff in black and white, all of that is exposition. It's setting up um, for the audience, the characters, and the situation that later becomes all important to Dorothy. The inciting incident, every plot has an event, something that happens, a decision made by the protagonist, in which, if well, it's the thing that if you took it out, the whole play would be different. It kind of sets the ball rolling. Um, if, for example, in The Wizard of Oz, there was no, tor no tornado, we'd have a completely different plot. So the tornado is the inciting incident in The Wizard of Oz because that's the event, again, that sets the ball rolling. Now, rising action is the bulk of your plot, of your script. Uh, because, again, you're playing with audiences' anticipation and you're playing with uh, conflict, the two most important things to drama. Rising action is all of that conflict, and we break that conflict down into a series of complications. Complications are any time that your protagonist confronts something that they have to overcome or some um, information that they have to understand. It is always complications, conflict that gets in the way of their goal. Um, each of these moments of conflict or complication has a high peak, has an emotional peak in which you're at the edge of your seat going, well, are they going to get it? Are they going to figure it out? Are they going to fail? Um, we call that the crisis. So again, rising action is a series of complications. Each complication has its own rise in anticipation and its crises moment. All of these complications are supposed to build in anticipation and interest until you reach the climax of the play, which should be the most emotionally intense moment of the play. It's kind of what we've all been waiting for. I'm sure you've heard the term anti-climax, meaning you've built up a whole bunch of expectations and anticipation, and then when you get to the climax, it really does not uh, fit. It does not seem as satisfying as it should feel. Okay, so if we go back to The Wizard of Oz, basically every Scene. This is why The Wizard of Oz is such a great example. Every complication is sandwiched between the song, Follow the Yellow Brick Road. So if you look at Dorothy's first complication, what is it? Well, she opens the door. She's in Oz. Where am I? And I really just want to go home. So we see her meeting characters, getting information, eventually deciding, oh, I'm going to follow that yellow brick road. I am going to go home. And then everybody sings because it's built to that moment where she's decided to go. And so everybody's singing, follow the yellow brick road, follow the yellow brick road. Okay, so we then have our second complication. 
she reaches a place where there's a why. Oh no, which way do I go with the road and a why? Do I go to the right? Do I go to the left? And there's a scarecrow who with points to both directions. And she's taken aback. Oh, you mean scarecrows talk in Oz? She has a conversation with him. The scene builds in anticipation. And then, yes, they're going to go on to the yellow brick road. In fact, she's going to have the scarecrow there with her. So we have a complication. It builds in anticipation. And then we move to the next scene, which is the Tin Woodsman. And then the next scene, and so forth, until we get to the end of the play. Our final slide, and the second slide um, that's discussing parts of the plot, really talks about three things that are happening throughout the rising action, which is all the complications and their crises moment. There is a point in really good scripts where you see the protagonist confronting a complication and one they do not overcome. It is called the reversal. It's a moment where you think your protagonist has, is going to get what they want. You think, oh gosh, maybe this is over. But something happens when it does not solve anything and that protagonist has to continue their journey. In The Wizard of Oz, there's a moment when Dorothy and her friends make it to Oz. That's been their goal. And they get there, and their goal is to get to Oz because they think they can get the Wizard of Oz to grant their wishes. And when they get there, he says, oh no, I'm not going to do that until you bring me back the broom of the Wicked Witch. Well, that means that they have to start another journey. They have to now find the Wicked Witch, somehow get her broom without being killed, and bring it back to the wizard. So that's the turning point, the reversal. And some scripts have more than one reversal. It keeps that anticipation growing. You know, you kind of step back and go, oh man, we got to start again. And then you begin again. And... Um, Again, it creates more and more and more anticipation. So by the time you get to the climax of the play, it is more effective. It means more. By the way, the climax to The Wizard of Oz is that moment we're all waiting for her to go home. Uh, when Linda says, go ahead, just click your heels together and you will go home. You'll be able to go home. That's what everything is building toward. That's the climax. Okay, another thing that happens throughout a play is foreshadowing. Um, there's always moments that you can look back in a play, in a script, and go, oh yeah, man, I should have known that was going to happen because of fill in the blank. Um, if you look at the beginning of uh, the Wizard of Oz, it is in the exposition that the foreshadowing starts. The actors who portray her three friends, uh, the Scarecrow, the Tin Woodsman, the Cowardly Lion, are the farmhands that are at the farm in black and white. So we get foreshadowing from the very beginning. When you see the Tin Woodsman in the woods, who do you see hiding behind some trees? A wicked witch. And that's giving you a hint. She's going to show up later. Foreshadowing is in every good script on a continual basis. Now the word discovery is really the term we use for when um, characters on stage learn bits of information. You know, like, oh, we got to go get the broom now. Um, oh, we can follow the yellow brick road. That's, when, that's what we call discovery, uh, a change from uh, ignorance to knowledge. And again, that's something that's happening continually throughout the play. But one of the main reasons I bring it up here is because sometimes clever writers will give the audience information the characters aren't aware of. If you watch the film, there's a scene 
after they get to Oz and talk to the wizard, where you see the Wicked Witch and her minions, those monkeys. And so you know they're setting up. They know that the monkeys and the witch, they know that Dorothy and her friends are coming. And so the audience now has a different set of expectations when Dorothy gets close to the castle and there's guards we know hey they're waiting on her they better be careful they better be quiet it adds a certain level of added anticipation excitement okay denouement is a fran fancy French word for falling action once you've had the climax the play is pretty much over but especially in older plays older dramas um, audiences wanted a feeling of closure. We call that the denouement, the falling action, where sometimes uh, plot ends and you, fi you find out what happens to characters. You know, in the, in the Wizard of Oz, it's when she awakens in Kansas and realizes, oh, so this was a dream. And you were there and you were there and, and, and oh, there's no place like home. That's the short but very successful closure to The Wizard of Oz. And again, that's called falling action. 